So, uh, you know, I, I love that we've got folks from all around the world joining us, not just in the U.S. It's primarily a U.S. audience today, but I see Australia, Belgium, Canada, Finland, the U.K., and, uh, you know, a lot of folks claiming just global or distributed organizations, uh, which, by the way, probably presents its own challenges and opportunities when it comes to OKRs. And I'm sure we'll, we'll cover that at some level today. Um, so uh, also looks like a great representation of folks from, what, Fortune 50 companies to startups. Uh, I see mid-sized companies. I see tech, financial services, consulting, banks, or, well, I guess that's financial services. But uh, yeah, you name it. Uh, we are in good company. I'd like to introduce a couple of guests today as we get started. One is Karen Schlomer, our producer. Uh, she's mostly going to be behind the scenes today, but does very important work. Uh, she's produced programs such as the International Women's Day uh, program for Care Canada. Uh, she has worked on the highly rated 1200 attendee virtual conference for Training Magazine. Uh, she most recently became a producer for the Young Presidents Organization, which is a very exclusive group. Uh, also, she sings barbershop quartet and karaoke and especially loves Queen songs. Uh, some of you might have met John Chen at uh, some of our other events. He literally wrote the book on engaging virtual meetings and Karen produces for him. So I know we're in good hands today. Uh, and Karen, if you wouldn't mind spotlighting Wendy, we also have our very special guest, Wendy Pat Fong today. Uh, Wendy, this audience is going to benefit so much from your background and insights. Would you mind telling us just a little bit about yourself? For sure. So my name is Wendy Pat Fong. I am currently strategic uh, manager at um, Ally.io, um, which is a Seattle-based organization focusing on OKRs. Um, my background is spent around eight plus years in the OKR space now, um, having held roles such as chief of staff, director of people and culture. And I have had the opportunity to work with wonderful customers across the world in terms of how to properly implement OKRs. Um, internally, but also making sure that it's a process that works for them in the long term. Um, so I'm absolutely excited to be part of this group today. Um, also, just a special shout out to Robert Saint-Jacques in the group. Um, actually, Robert and I used to be co-workers before, so it's such a small world. <laughs> I'm really happy to see him on this call. Awesome. Well, thank you. And, you know, we wanted to bring this community together, Wendy, as you know, because OKRs are a topic that flare up in our global chief of staff workspace uh, in Slack uh, a fair amount. If you're uh, not already a part of that community, I'm going to drop the link in the chat for you. Um, you know, there are just so much information on what OKRs are and how to roll them out. Uh, you know, some of that info is even written by chiefs of staff. I've shared and highlighted some of that info before. My newsletters are on the Slack workspace. And if you've been to my events before, you know, I don't really like to cover content that you can just Google. So, you know, what I've been hearing from folks about OKRs is really the challenges beyond the rollout, beyond the basics. So I invited Wendy to draw on her exper expertise in this arena. Uh, you know, and we're pretty sure you're going to walk away from today with number one, a better understanding of how to tie your strategy to your OKRs or vice versa. And even then, once you've rolled it all out, a better understanding of what's next. You know, what are the business rhythms that support an OKR culture? How do you operationalize and process, uh, the, you know, all the, uh, run the meetings and so forth? And finally, some best practices that'll help you with challenges uh, beyond the rollout. So creating a playbook that you can use for your initial rollout, but also for new hires coming after, uh, you know, getting ahead of people, performance and culture issues, things like that. So, Wendy, a, a lot of chiefs of staff own the strategic planning process. Mm -hmm. A lot of them own OKRs. Sometimes they own one or the other. Sometimes they own both. But what I've run across is chiefs of staff who've either been handed separate processes for each of these things, or they see them as distinct and not really sure how to tie them all together. So how do best organizations tie all the pieces together and make sure there's alignment? 
Yeah, so it's interesting to see that um, people might consider these as two processes because what we want to look at, especially in this um, graph here, I'll try to move it properly, is um, OKRs is the most powerful when it comes from your organization DNA, right? So even starting with the vision and the mission in terms of what do we want to accomplish, that's an OKR in itself, right? Like we know what our goal is and we know for our mission how we're going to get there. So it is very important to make sure that these two processes go hand in hand in terms of understanding what our vision mission is, even how what our core values, right? So what do we hold ourselves accountable when it comes to behavior? And then it cascades down into the strategy. So looking at the three to five year in terms of, you know, what the success looks like for us. OKR comes in on in terms of execution, focus and also on the alignment part. So it's great. We understand what our high level strategy is, right? So many of you probably already have your outcome for 2025. But what we want to distill here is to making sure that there's an alignment. So what we're working on a day-to-day -day basis, it's going to eventually contribute to the strategy that we have set for ourselves. We want to make sure that it's transparent so everyone understands how we are all coming together to reach our goal but also around like execution, right? So one big thing around OKRs is that we are, when you look at your three to five um, year strategy, there are a million ways for you to get there, right? And with OKRs, it's very much giving you the exercise of how can we prioritize, right? So how can we select that three to five big bets or big rocks, however you want to call it, that will have the biggest impact on our outcome. So that is where it is very important to link both of them together. And often what I have seen with organization when they first launch OKRs is they don't do any reflection or they don't look back at, you know, what is our, why, why is our company here? Right. So they all look forward and they go, I already know what I need to work for 2022. So I'm going to turn them into OKRs. Mm -hmm. And often that's where the gap is missing because it's always looking forward. Mm -hmm. But there is the exercise of reflection, right, to be able to say, what have we done really well the past two to three quarters? What have we not done too, too well in these two to three quarters that are actual blockers? Because these blockers are things that we do need to address so that we can eventually reach our strategy for like 2025. So it is important either for like, you know, a chief of staff, either if you in the strategic planning process um, to be involved with your OKR champion, to be able to share that story of why are we here? What are we trying to do? And get everyone involved in terms of how do we want to use OKRs to reflect our big bets in, and also identify what success means for us. But if you are also just, let's say, for example, an OKR champion, that needs to be an understanding with your leadership team that OKRs is only going to be successful if a strategy are properly shared. Right, like often three to five year strategic, um, you know, outcomes or priorities are not shared across the organization, but OKRs is that common language, right? It's breaking down the high level, you know, leadership team, management, board of director language into something that everyone can understand. Even for me as an individual contributors, I understand why I'm coming to work. I understand what my work is contributing to, and I also can recognize what the success means for me as an individual, me as a team, but also me as a company. Yeah, so many good points in there. You know, uh, if I were to do an informal, uh, we didn't actually set up this poll in advance, but since you mentioned it, uh, if anybody wants to put in the, the chat just a simple yes or no, if you have a founder, or CEO or leadership team who have a hard time prioritizing, just say yes or no in the chat. Um, you know, one of the, the questions I've heard from chiefs of staff over and over again is, uh, you know, that my, my founders or my CEO, they want to maximize for optionality. They never seem to want to put a stick in, uh, you know, stake in the ground. They have a hard time with that process. So, um, 
I'll let others ask in just a sec. I want others to ask questions of, of Wendy in the chat as well, but uh, that I'll just start there and kind of, I guess, lead by example with our Q and a today. Like, how do you, how do you kind of wrangle those cats? There you go. There's a poll on the fly. I love it. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Prioritization. I think a lot of people talk about it, right? Like we all talk about, yes, what are our priorities? What are our priorities? Um, but the, the way that I like to look at OKRs is, let's say, you know, all of us, we are like tree cutters, like, you know, our role is to cut trees and our, you know, the purpose of our organization is to create a path from the forest to the mountain in the most efficient and quickest way, right? So for us as, you know, individual contributors, including your leadership team, if we cut trees in a circle, are we busy? The answer is yes. Right. Are we actually, you know, cutting through a path that gets you the quickest from the forest to the mountain? The answer is no. So I think often it it is taking that step back. And one thing that I've seen with OKRs, at least that I really appreciate, is the concept of reflection and scoring. And I think that's often where leadership team do not spend the time and do it but when you make them do it and you say look we set you know 10 objective how many have we actually achieved often it might be two right so it's asking the question of then why are we setting ourselves up for failure in terms of why are we spreading ourselves so thin that we are mediocre or average across 10 things compared to being the best at three to five Right. So it's often asking that question. And I think that with prioritization with the teams that I have worked with is often when we ask a question of, you know, what has worked really well and what hasn't worked really well, we really discover these blockers for people to just be like, oh, yeah, you know what, quarter of a quarter, we didn't have the right data analytics. We didn't have the right reporting. We didn't have the right software. And I'm like, where is it in your OKRs for next quarter then? Right. That's awesome. I know you're speaking the language of 86% of the folks on the call right now, according to the poll. So uh, that's awesome. So other questions that folks have for Wendy around alignment of the strategy to your OKRs, uh, specifically on that, we are going to have other, we're going to cover some other topics here shortly. So hold, hold your thoughts on other topics, but let's keep it focused on that right now. Let's see what comes in. Um, you can drop that in the chat while we wait for questions to come then I just also wanted to bring up one thing with OKR especially around implementation when it comes to the topic of alignment I think a lot of like at least the best practices or the lesson learned even for myself is often we are in that mindset of everything needs to be aligned Right. So we have the objective on the company level, then on a department level, it's almost like, okay, I need to make sure that or almost force it. Right. Almost like force like a round, um, a round piece of puzzle into like a square where we just need to have that alignment. And often that's where it goes often wrong because it doesn't surface what we call like the bottom up, the bottom up feedback of understanding that, first of all, not all objective needs to be aligned. That's one thing. Um, second of all is alignment goes multiple ways. It doesn't always have to be top down, right? So especially mm-hmm. if you have teams that are in more supporting roles, whether it's legal, HR, you know, um, finance, you might not always have that perfect alignment to the top, right? Mm-hmm. But you might have a perfect alignment on a horizontal level. They might need your help to be successful with their OKRs. So a lateral alignment is also very important. But that's what I have seen. And I always recommend individuals to, when they look at OKRs, is yes, we want to understand where the company is going to, right? We want to understand what the success looked like. But it is also very important to slowly work on that muscle. Mm -hmm. Um, OKRs is a new muscle that you're stretching, right? It needs to be, you need to go slow, um, start to build it, build it, and then 
sort to make the customization in terms of what works for you. So that's one big thing that I would say when it comes to alignment, to not be so focused on that top-down alignment, Mm -hmm. but also looking at more the horizontal level and breaking down any silos or barriers across the departments as well. Which leads really well into Philip's question. The first question we got in the chat, how do you keep a team aligned when distributed and remote? That's perfect because that's what we started with, right? We've got a number of teams claiming global, distributed, hybrid. I mean, they're in all these different variations of that. Uh, So that would be really cool. Yeah, in terms of making sure that, you know, your team is aligned um, when distributed and remote, the first one is, again, making sure that your team OKRs are clear, right? So we come together as a group. And again, reflection can be done on each of a different level, but even having a reflection, we just did one with our team at the end of this quarter to talk about what does Q4 looks like for us? Like, what do we want to take on as our big bets? And the beauty with OKRs when done properly is that you as a leader, as a team leader or like an organization leader, is you are letting people understand the what, right? You're almost setting that framework of this is what success is for for us or for you. Um, With OKRs is then encouraging employees to come up with a how, Mm -hmm. right? So we're not forcing you, we're not micromanaging in terms of this is what you need to do to get there, is there are, again, a million ways of you to get to the same results is this is where we want to empower employees to get there. So in terms of the alignment, especially for a remote team is, and we'll talk about this um, a little bit after, is creating the right business rhythm, right? So as an employee, when I'm setting my objective, especially if I'm not with my team members, I want to make sure that if I have any blockers, Or if I have great wins, that these are being celebrated. So again, having that OKRs in terms of tracking progress, understanding where everyone is at, but also allowing each of us to be proactive. So if someone is falling behind, to be able to have that real-time data and for us to be able to jump in rather than wait until the end of a quarter and then realize that we could have done all of these changes to make sure that we're successful. But because we didn't have a right cadence or the right rhythm to talk about these OKRs in real time, we miss the mark. Cool. Well, um, that's a good one. And we can even circle back to that again um, here in just a minute in a little more detail. Um, But it looks like another another question here is is really providing some insight on how to help the leaders prioritize those three to five objectives. So I know a lot of times you get into that leadership team meeting, the conversations are kind of spinning or going off into rabbit holes and all these things. Like, how do you, how do you wrangle those conversations in the moment? I actually have some perspectives on that too, but I'll let you go first. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, what we have done, like at least now and with the customers I'm working with is again, the prioritization always come after a reflection. Um, And very much understanding, like, you know, where are our gaps and where do we need to focus, but also looking a little bit like, especially if you're working for like a product organization, is looking at where are our areas of opportunity, Mm -hmm. right? Again, remember that OKRs is not business as usual. It's not your BAU. It's not necessarily things that's keeping the lights on. OKRs is very much like, what can we do to have a big impact that we're currently not doing that we want to track the progress, right? So that's where we want to be able to, first of all, make sure that what we always really appreciated was also having the, the right constraint, Right, the right constraint of understanding that whether you have limited resources in terms of budgeting or, you know, like headcounts or anything like that. So that when you're looking at priorities, we want to be realistic to a point. Um, And I think that has been really helpful because, again, I'm sure you have encountered that before. You might be one of, um, you know, like you, you might be one that often is really great with brainstorming and, you know, blue sky sort of like discussion. 
Um, but what we always want to make sure with OKRs when we set our priorities is, do we have the right resources to get there? If we do not, what do we have to do? Do we believe that it's going to have a biggest impact because we're only choosing three to five. So I have seen some organization that will do like, um, if you like, if you are familiar with product, they'll do like a poker game where you have only specific amount of chips that you can vote for the priorities. Um, but the biggest thing that I would say is always feedback from bottom up. Um, that has been one of the biggest thing is often if your organization is quite, you know, large is we want to make sure that we are getting the feedback of our frontline employees because they know what is happening with, with the organization. So allow them to be that devil's advocate, allow them to be able to ask, why are we doing A instead of B? Um, to be able to make sure that we are having the right priorities from there. I love that. And uh, sp speaking of being really focused, you know, I've got uh, somebody pinging me about not being able to access the, the webinar. So I'm like trying to troubleshoot while you're talking, but that is a, a lot of really good points. And um, I suspect, you know, uh, one of the things I've become more and more convinced about is maybe the most important skill for chiefs of staff is that facilitative leadership, you know, uh, having, getting the right stakeholders together to have the right conversations and create shared context. So it create, it, it, it requires a lot of intentionality as you go into those conversations where, you know, there's going to be a lot of rabbit holes to maybe you steal a metaphor like the forest to the mountains from somebody that you've heard it from and use that to frame up a discussion like that. You know, I, you know, folks, I see that we're all very busy, but are we really focused on the things that make the most difference? You've got to create that shared context. And without that, it's going to be really hard. So, um, so, okay. Good to know there were some folks that also had some issues, but um, at any rate, um, I'll, we'll take care of that. Um, Let's see, M moving right. Oh, somebody also asked about the, um, what's the relationship between roadmaps and, uh, you know, your, your OKRs and, and what's the interaction between those? And then we should probably move on to our next question when we're done with that. Yeah, I mean, roadmap is almost like, you want to look at it from like an OKR perspective as well, right? So when you set a roadmap, you do the constant review. Right. So whether it's every quarter, whether it's after, you know, you, you release one features after the other is there is that part again where we do a review of are we still valid? Um, is this what our customer wants? If we're going to do, you know, what we have set ourselves of a roadmap, are we looking at what's happening from the external side, right? What are our competitors doing? What are our customers looking for? What are the new trends? Right? So it's a little bit of the same thing with OKRs. And again, the, the reason why OKRs has been so successful is because we have always talked about goal setting from an annual perspective, right? And I'm sure all of us know that, you know, or most of the personal goals that you set for yourself during New Year um, by February, right? most of it doesn't work anymore. It's right. the same concept here, right? So when it comes to roadmap, it is the biggest thing that OKRs has pulled out from a lot of individual is when we look at a roadmap that we have decided maybe a couple of months before, is then setting ourselves up for the measurement of success, right? So if we decide to do, you know, feature A versus feature B, what is the, what are the measures of success? So what are the KRs that we're trying to move here? Right. So do we all agree that we're trying to move um, adoption of a platform, you know, increase sales, um, you know, making sure that we have better retention of our customers? This is where I think also when it comes to prioritization, KRs is where it opens a lot of people's eyes, right? To be able to say that, oh, we are measuring something specific to the organization now. Now let's take a step back and look at the roadmap. So we have one that we have set for ourselves. Of course, during the quarter, you'll get multiple requests coming in from customers, right? So it's going through the same prioritization process that we just talked about is, again, which one do we want to make sure that we'll pull all of our resources towards to make sure that it'll have the biggest impact? So yes, it goes hand in hand, um, but again, the process around it is what makes it so fantastic, right? Is in terms of doing the review, 
the reflection and then turning all of our goals into something that is very measurable will help will make people think about their initiative and what they want to work on in a different light. Okay. And uh, Laura just asked a question too, and we'll circle back to it in a little bit because I want to actually uh, get on with another question as well. So uh, we will hold that hold that thought, Laura. Uh, she's asking about the relationship between OKRs and KPIs, dashboards, and balanced scorecards. So we'll come back to that in just a little bit um, because I actually think we might we might end up covering that in some of these other questions. So for example, you know. Um, I've spoken to chiefs of staff who seemingly flawlessly rolled out their OKRs, but then the unforeseen problems start kicking in, right? They, um, you know, they changing circumstances, I don't know, for example, like a global pandemic, not that that would ever happen, caused our OKRs to shift and change so frequently and so rapidly that it was really hard to tell how useful they were because we're just trying to keep up with what's going on and we've got so many challenges coming at us. How do you keep pace with the rapid change around your organization is one question. And then, you know, it, everyone was on board with OKRs um, when we rolled it out, but we didn't have a great tool for visualizing OKRs to the entire company for maximum transparency and performance management. And it's really hard to do that from an Excel spreadsheet, so, for example. So my question would be, I guess overall to capture situations like these, after the rollout, what's next? Are there business rhythms that can help with those issues? How do you operationalize the OKR process? Uh, maybe we'll cover some of those other questions about KPIs and dashboards and, and tools along the way, but I, I'm curious about that. In terms of pivot, I think when, when COVID hit, um, it, was, it was interesting. It was interesting because we had, you know, like customers coming and saying that, okay, well, none of my OKRs is valid anymore, right? Because things mm -hmm. has changed. Um, however, I, I would argue that, again, that's the whole focus around OKRs is making sure that we are agile and we're dynamic, we're responding to what is happening, you know, outside of our, our own control, but making sure that we redirect the focus on what can we do to be successful now, right? So we have a lot of organizations that we work with where we just said, you know what, abandon your OKRs, whether it's halfway through the quarter, it doesn't work. And why are you putting resources in yeah. things that you know is not going to get you out of that hole, right? We work with a lot of small and medium-sized organization that are bootstrapped, didn't have, you know, um, any funding to be able to get them through. And we're like, then pivot. I think Karen mentioned that as a hashtag, right? In yes. terms of you need to pivot. And when you pivot, OKRs, again, becomes that employee engagement part where you let everyone know we got this. We know what our focus is. Maybe we can't plan for, you know, the 2025 strategy anymore, mm -hmm. but let's plan for what is within our control. What can we do oh now? Gosh. How can we rally the team? How do we all come together to make sure that we keep <laughs> our milestone a little bit shorter, but we hit them and gain traction from there? That is such an important point. Uh, just quickly, you know, I've, I've run into so many companies who are still trying to achieve stretch goals. And, and I've talked to them about, you know, you know, right now you're in an existential crisis. You might not be here next week if you don't address some of these other things. Like, yeah, forget all that. <laughs> so, so I love uh, how you're focused on that. So um, yeah, but, uh, but, but keep going. I, I, I love this, uh, this line of thinking. And I know you mentioned around the, the, the tool in itself, right? So again, I can sit here for the next 30 minutes and talk about tool, but with any process that you put into place, like I think most of you know that it's the process in itself is 80% of the whole success, right? 20% is whatever platform you might use. So whether you're using um, any, you know, Okay, or software out there that helps you elevate, um, you know, the, the data in a more visual way. The biggest thing, again, that makes 
the biggest impact is how do you implement OKRs in your company DNA, in your company culture, right? So OKR shouldn't be reduced to, oh, things I put on an Excel sheet. These are great. But how do we talk about it, right? So during your town hall meeting, are you having this conversation? Um, during your one-on-one, are you bringing up like, you know, employees OKRs or your team OKRs to remind them in terms of why are we here together? What are we trying to accomplish? So there are different areas that we want to look into, but when it comes to the software in itself is what I always tell, you know, people that have worked with is the software should be customized to you. Right. Like, so if you haven't figured out the right process, you haven't figured out what works best for us in terms of how do we want to use OKRs, going and finding a platform is you don't want to conform to what they can offer you. Right. You want to be able to come to the table and say, this is how my company does OKR. Right. So whether we brew it up in the company hands on, like our managers use it for the dashboard, uh, we do a presentation every quarter, we do our reflection. You need to go to any vendors and to be able to say, this is how we do it. Can you support it rather than the other way around? So even with if you're doing it just on Excel right now, again, that's not necessarily what will make or break your OKR process. What will make and break it is, again, how do you implement it in people's day-to-day? How do you implement it in your company DNA or your company culture to make sure that it's not a once, you know, an ad hoc process that we put in, but it is something that we hold ourselves accountable quarter over quarter moving forward. Yeah, for sure. And it, it seems to me, for example, that the, um, you know, that the Excel spreadsheet lends itself to kind of the back end data or the things that are going on with the OKRs, but, but kind of coming into your workspace in the morning, opening up your laptop or your, your, your tablet and you look at it and there's just a dashboard there that shows you like the high level or, or where there's issues that you might want to drill down on. I mean, you can do that in Excel. You can do a lot, a lot in, in Excel, but uh, if that's not so scalable with everybody, it, just using it in a shared doc, uh, maybe a, a platform or a, a more robust tool would be a lot more um, helpful for the organization. So, um, yeah, we've got this, uh, the poll, uh, just describing your, your uh, quarterly OKR check-in rhythm. How often do you meet? Uh, weekly, or sorry, greater than weekly, once a week, bi-weekly, monthly, we only use annual, or we haven't formalized a rhythm yet. And we've got nearly 50% at we haven't formalized a rhythm mm-hmm. yet leading the way um, with uh, once a week, 26%, is followed by monthly. I, you know, you can keep, uh, keep plugging in your results in the poll, but I think we could call the election at this point. It's, uh, I think the numbers are, are pretty they're, they're hovering around the same amounts. So let's see, 10%. Yeah. So monthly is creeping up. Okay. Yep. Love it. Okay. It is something that I see often in terms of not formalizing a rhythm around it. And I think the, the disadvantage of not having a clear is around change management, right? So I'm sure, you know, whichever phase of implementation of OKRs you are, there has been a point where you have been met with resistance, right? Like people say, why am I doing this? Like, I'm already mm-hmm. busy. You're asking me to do something, an- another thing on my plate, right? And often what happened with OKRs is we don't set the expectation up front, right? We don't let people know, hey, your job is not going to change massively. Actually, OKRs is going to help you do your job better, (laughs) right? And what does that mean? That means that we would love you to be able to update your objective maybe once every week or once every two weeks. Um, and, And I think often, again, we focus so much on the leadership team when it comes to OKRs. And then usually the next group of people that we focus around is all all, all the employees, right? But one group that I often see is missing is the management team. Um, Management team, not necessarily on like, you know, a leadership level, but if your organization is quite big, like any of like the management team that are closer to 
um, the actual individual contributors, they are the ones that doesn't always get the love, but they are the ones so important to the success of your OKRs because they are the one that is bridging your top down and your bottom up, right? They are the one that looks at the top down in terms of understanding what my team needs to perform in terms of being successful. And the bottom up is I'm as a manager or working with my team on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that I remove any blockers, I celebrate their wins, I elevate them in terms of skill and competencies to make them successful. So by not having a, a rhythm, it's really tough for especially new managers. Like I'm sure many of you might have that right now where like, you know, your, your organization grew really quickly. People that doesn't have any management um, experience suddenly becomes managers of a group of like five, a group of 10. So having formalizing a process around it in terms of implementing a business rhythm to be able to say at the start of a quarter, the first two weeks, the expectation is that we set our objective, we draft it, and we do our handshake, which is that we commit to the objective that we have put into place. Then in between, we require when should you do the check-in, why should you do the check-in, right? And I think the context building is really big here, is I think to what Tyler was saying is you can have a percentage on an Excel sheet, but it tells you nothing. Right, like just for the sake of measuring something without the context will bring nothing to your organization. What people want to know is what does that number mean? Are we on track? Are we off track? If we're on track, what are the fantastic things that we are doing that we should keep doing? If we're off track, what are our blockers? How do we make sure that we get back on track? Right, these are the information that people are looking for. It's, these are the things that they're craving for, not just having a dashboard to just see, okay, we're at 50%, then I'm going to go and, and get back on, on my day-to-day -day work. It's creating that storytelling. And again, it's reselling in terms of why are we doing this? Why are we making sure that we're taking accountability? How, are, how is us taking accountability going to make us successful? That's where the rhythm comes in. And, you know, that's such an important point, Wendy, and you uh, to tie it back to something you said earlier about the horizontal alignment. I mean, it strikes me that a lot of times the vertical, uh, the, the numbers that show up in terms of vertical alignment indicate where you need to deep dive on the, the horizontal alignment issues. So, you know, if, if you're not meeting your objectives as a team for how, it, how things get delivered at the line level of the organization to support the big strategic objectives. When you say, why not? That's usually gets you into a cross departmental conversation pretty quickly. Well, you know, we've got workflow issues or breakdown in communication between this group or that group, or we've got an inefficient process here that could be shortened from a week to three days or something like that. You know, there's all these issues across teams that you start getting into that horizontal alignment piece, right? And, and I love how this kind of ties it all together and enables you to drill down into, into both. Um, and it looks like uh, Alex had a question up above. I did miss that. Uh, sorry, Alex. Let's go find that. What are your thoughts on the right OKR setting process and cadence to incorporate the bottoms up aspect? How long should an OKR cycle take? How many weeks? What are the various steps you recommend? And I know he's getting ready to hop off, but. That is a great question. A uh, <laughs> Maybe we can and, get and, something quick. And, and, and the answer that I'm sure a lot of people do not appreciate is it depends. <laughs> Let mm. me explain a little bit more here. Is It really depends in terms of the size of your organization and how quickly your organization runs in terms of its processes. So when I first joined a startup, for example, where we were like a team of 10, is instead of setting quarterly objective, we set monthly objective. Like to what you were saying, Tyler, it's like, we didn't know if we had enough runway to pay everyone right. in the next two months to come. So again, we wanted to take element of OKRs that we appreciate, which was focus, transparency, alignment. And that's what we took out of OKRs and we made it our own. When it comes to bottom up process in itself is 
again, trying to understand the, the with them, right? So what's in it for me, especially when it comes on an individual level. And what I mean by that is, how do you make sure that the process of checking in or the process of setting the, an objective matches how they do their work? So quarterly has always been a, a great cadence in general because it's not too long that people forget about it, but it's also not too short that you are not given the opportunity to get feedback and, you know, remove any blockers to be successful. So that three month sort of like, you know, timeline works really well. I seen other organization, again, um, that will make it to what their, or how their organization works. I seen some companies that will do company OKRs um, that is annual and then departmental and individuals are on a quarterly basis. I seen it other way around, which is company department or on an annual basis, sub teams and individuals on a quarterly basis. But what is important when you look at the process in terms of how often are we telling people to check in, for example, is you always need to match something else with it, right? So for example, if I'm requiring all of my team members to update the OKRs on a weekly basis, is what process do I match with it? Is it a one-on-one? -on -one? So do I then have a weekly one-on-one -on -one to be able to say, hey, you did your check-in, let's talk about it together and let's see what your next week look like. Or do we do like bi-weekly check-ins and then we do like a monthly one-on-one, -on -one, right? So the biggest thing, again, is for you to identify what's in it for me, for you to also then figure out what is the right cadence for the organization. Again, this is where it will very much depend. Like I have some teams, for example, they run like the sprint cycle, um, and they do it in, again, a different cadence of like every three months, right? So for them specifically with a team, they come up with their own um, rhythm of business in terms of if we do, you know, any sprints like every like, you know, six weeks or anything like that, then at the six month, uh, six week mark, we do the check-in. So rather than every two weeks or four weeks, we do it at the six week mark. So the biggest thing that I would say, um, Alex here is, OKRs is going to be the most successful when it's customized to you. Like what you're reading out there in terms of books and articles, these are all best practices, right? Or, or these are all like case studies of what has worked well for these individuals, but it might not be applicable to you and your organization. So the best way always is to, first of all, does do the customization, but make sure that you have supporting process that is align with how you're doing it. So again, if we're doing all of a weekly um, check-ins, then on an organization level, you might want your CEO to be able to do like a monthly town hall and talk about this progress, right? Like there needs to be a reward that goes into a new habit for you to be able to drive the right habit um, as it keeps building up. Yeah, that's awesome. And we, um, it's, it's really great too, because that kind of leads right into our next topic. And I know you've covered it in a couple, from a couple of different angles so far, but I'm wondering if you have additional insights. You know, one of the things that, that I hear about a lot is, you know, everybody was bought into the OKRs when we created it as a team. But then over time, some of that team drops off. We get new hires who aren't as familiar with the context in which all those things were set. And uh, you know, or hadn't been there when they were developed. So, you know, how do you onboard people into an OKR culture and how do you keep it from turning from, you know, turning into a fad instead of, you know, maintaining it in your culture? And I know you've hit it a couple of times, but I, I wonder if there's more to that. I would say this is where um, the power of HR comes in. Um, and I, I might be slightly biased here. I, I do have an HR background, but it's, the, it's important, again, for you to, after the implementation is done, is exactly this question, Tyler, is for you to take a step back and look at, now that we have implemented OKRs, it's still new, right? So how do we make sure that we, we are supporting people? So the organization that have done it really well, like one, one of them I know have created a whole playbook. They have created a whole playbook where they explain what did we do before OKRs and why are we doing OKRs now? What has been the journey? What is the expectation? What are we looking at? And the playbook very much helped with the people side. 
right? So when you have new hires, being able to bring that up, looking at even your onboarding deck, right? Be able to talk about OKRs upfront in terms of onboarding deck, being able to introduce to everyone. We do OKRs here at organization A, you know, these are our objective for 2022. And our CEO always give an update, like on a monthly basis or bi-weekly basis in terms of what the updates are. And this is what OKRs will help you achieve as you become part of our organization. That's so one. I- I can hear just real quick. I can hear some people in the background almost saying, we have an onboarding process. Wow. That's amazing that I know a lot of companies aren't even at that point. Is that easy to decentralize to the hiring managers or something until you have more formal processes stood up? It absolutely is. Right. So either it's like, I I work with one of a startup that just had like one slide. Um, on a deck in just just to explain what what it was yeah. but again and and that's where I talked about you know putting bringing in the managers as part of your champions as well right like the, the one that we talked about that often ignored is we want the managers to be able to talk about it as well like during the 30 60 90 days right in terms of this is how our team runs we set objective we set specific um, you know key results and we empower you to find the how to hit these key results, right? So being able, again, to making sure it's part of your language within an organization is definitely really important. Um, then, of course, like we're looking at things such as process, right? So process can be things like, like a performance review or even like your one-on-ones. So how do we surface OKRs in different aspects of the organization, Often from a chief of staff perspective, like especially if you're working really close with your CEO or your LT, it's very much around, you know, this strategic vision, the alignment and all of these things. And what often get missed is where else in the organization can we plug in OKRs, right? Onboarding is one of them. Often recruitment is another one of them, right? Like, have you had any candidate ask you, like, you know, your organization tell us that you're transparent, but what does transparent mean, mm-hmm. right? If you're able to pull out that three OKRs and then be able to show progress, being able to show the key updates, it's showing alignment, it's showing transparency, it's showing how your organization function, right? So on a recruitment side, it's fantastic. Then we look at performance review or coaching, right? Like having new managers, how to have conversation around performance. Often OKRs can be that driver, that starter of a conversation of, we have set these expectations at the start of a quarter, right? We both have agreed. Now let's look at them. How are we doing on them? How, where do you need more help? Like what skills and competencies have you been using, right? And then it could go into performance review. Again, having that conversation of, for this year, have your OKRs properly reflect your performance? What else have you done that you have gone above and beyond that's not properly reflected? Mm-hmm. Let's talk about, you know, what are the resources that you need next year for you to be better? So there are a lot of aspects to look into. And, I'm, and, and, and I know OKRs can be very overwhelming, especially if it's not your full-time job. Right, like very much a lot of us, it has been something that has been put on our plate that we're managing 90% of other things and now we have to take a look at it. So a recommendation here is build your network of champions, right? Look across the organization, who can be that executive sponsor for you? Who in the leadership team truly live and breathe and understand why OKRs is so important? Get them on board. Right. If you have any managers that, you know, want to go above and beyond being involved in the strategic planning, because that's what's going to help them move to the next level, engage them, get a network of champions that will help you spread the communication of OKRs in all of the different ways that maybe you can't because you don't have a bandwidth to do it. So rely on that um, network of champions to be able to help you. And that's definitely one of the things around process that I would say is often missed out. Like often it's that one person, right? And to your point, Tyler, they leave the organization 
then what happened? Right. <laughs> so having that, again, that network of champion is very, very helpful in terms of making sure that you are getting feedback from bottom up, right? These are the people that work with different groups. So they understand what's happening. They are getting the feedback, but also they are the people that will be that presence for you in the organization to talk about OKRs on a continuous basis. I love that point because, uh, you know, I can't really see a show of hands, physical hands right now, but, uh, you know, I know a lot of chiefs of staff who, who are always pushing their execs to delegate more. And yet we find ourselves in this boat sometimes too, where we are not leveraging the, the network around us to be champions and do stuff, take stuff off our plate, which is hard for chiefs of staff because we've earned our place at the table because of our reputation for getting things done, being fixers and doers. But when you get to that C-suite table, it's a bit of a different, it's a mind shift. And it's, it's really getting things done through other people a lot more than you might have been used to before. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's another um, really interesting kind of mindset aspect to this too, that, that can really be so, so powerful. Uh, you don't have to do it all. And uh, you probably can't do it all, so don't try. Um, you know, what questions do you all have on the culture side of things? We've got a few more minutes here, um, and we probably got time for a couple questions here before we just open it up to a broad Q&A. Um, or maybe if you don't have culture questions, maybe we'll just go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and open it up to culture and other questions, so. And if, uh, let's see, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. If only we had video or audio of crickets chirping. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's thinking. But that's kind of how I, it was earlier. And then they started pouring in. So Yeah, I would love to go back to, I think it was Laura's questions around um dashboards and KPIs dashboards. yeah yeah go ahead and so I think I have it here like Laura Laura asked what's the relationship between OKRs and KPI dashboard balance scorecard I think that's a fantastic question because they all somehow interrelate to each other while they support each other as well so we'll just start with a balance scorecard um balance scorecard in terms of how I've been using it in an OKR context is um, very much, you know, understanding what are the pillars to the organization, right? So especially as you're creating company objective is um, for the leadership team to be able to define what are the pieces of a puzzle for us in terms of success, right? So if you're familiar with balance scorecard, you often have these categories like, you know, financial, um, you know, stakeholders, customers. And often that's how we have seen people set, you know, the umbrella in terms of what company OKRs would be. So if I'm taking like a, a for profit, let's say product org, um, you usually will have, you know, revenue, right? For, for profit, you might have one around, you know, your customers in terms of customer delight, satisfaction, retention. And then often what we've seen would be something around, um, fine, um, we'd already talked about financial, but around people. Right. So we want to be the best place to work. We want to make sure that our employees are engaged. And then if you, you know, creating a product or services, that's often a category, category of, of its own. In terms of how we look at KPIs is, you know, from your balance scorecard or like, you know, any other methodology that you might take, you have these like key performance indicators that you're tracking. So one analogy that I really loved was when um, someone talked to me about, um, you know, like, you have a nice Lamborghini or like a Ferrari or any of these nice car, right? So this is your organization. Um, OKRs, and, and you know that, you know, your the whole, the whole journey is that you're going from point A to point B, right? So from your current state, point B could be your, your mission and your purpose of the organization. How they explained it to me was really neat in terms of your OKRs is your GPS, Right, your OKR is how do I get from point A to point B, whether in the most efficient way or maybe in the most scenic way that I want, right? So OKRs is how do you get from point A to point B? Your KPIs is basically like your car dashboard, 
right? It's looking at the health of your car. So we're looking at, you know, your engine light, your, um, your fuel gauge, um, your temperature or anything like that. So these are the things that keeps the company going. So, however, when something happens on your dashboard, um, you need to stop your car and pull it aside, right? So if, you know, the engine light come up, you need to pull aside to your car and check what is happening. That's where you'll see the relationship around, you know, KPIs and OKRs in itself. OKRs are what's driving, um, you know, results in terms of your KPI, but not all of your KPIs will always be key results. So um, if I have an example is, if you're looking at something like payroll, um, right? Like we, we need to make sure that we, you know, pay all of our people on time. That wouldn't necessarily be a KR in itself, but it's probably going to belong in your KPI sheet, right? Because it is something that we need to make sure that it maintains the health of the organization and um, that we need to keep track on. If somehow we are not hitting the number for the payroll, like we're not doing it on time, we need to stop and figure out what is happening. Why are we not paying our employees on time? Is it a lack of fun? Is it like, you know, a technology shut down? What, what is happening that is impacting the health of my car? So that's how you usually will see the distinction that yes, there will be some key performance indicators that will become part of your KRs. Um, but often, again, we want to make the distinction between business as usual and OKRs in itself, right? Like if these are two different things, like you don't want to make sure that your OKR is things that would keep maintaining um, your organization. OKRs would be things that will be exploring a new um, segment or expanding a new um, a current product or services is how you want to make the distinction there. So they all speak to each other, right? So it's not like one will replace something else, but often again, like the companies I work um, that has done OKRs really well have been the one that pulls in different um, areas that they think works the best, right? So well, a balanced scorecard is a great way to start with that pillars. KPIs is great for us to understand what does health of the organization means. And OKRs is let's charge forward and focus on execution. And then let's see how we move the needle forward. Awesome. Thank you. And I know there was one other question in the chat real quick before we have to think about wrapping up. And by the way, before you have to drop off at the end of the hour, if you can, Wendy's going to stick around for about 10, 15 more minutes afterwards uh, to do additional Q&A. Uh, so if you don't get your answers question or your questions answered right away, uh, if you can stick around. Um, but I know Heather asked, you know, uh, she was really interested in the point about OKRs not being the best way to capture run the engine work, um, you know, and any advice about how to use OKRs as a goal framework for a division that does both types of work. And maybe, maybe that answered the question a little bit, but, um, and I'll, I'll leave it up to Heather to chime in, but I think, um, I wonder if there might be any more insight on that particular aspect you could I have seen companies that will do it differently. And I think this is where, when you look at the types of OKRs, you could argue that there are two types. Like one is what we would call like a committed objective, right? So you heard of like the concept of stretch goal, challenging goals. Um, so these would be more on the aspirational side, but not a lot of people talk about the committed ones, right? The committed ones are the ones that we need to hit a hundred percent. So we're not really stretching ourselves here. These are the things that, again, that we, we want to make sure that, first of all, the organization understand that quarter over quarter, these are the things that are truly important to us. So if we were to look at an example is an airline, um, you know, like safety is always going to be one of those um, committed OKRs that we can't, we can't play around safety regulations here, right? Like we need to hit it all the time. And often I have seen organization that will still put it as an OKR. So for them to understand that, for everyone to understand that safety is something important to us. So then we need to make sure that either we're finding ways to improve it or we're making sure that we're maintaining that st like the status quo. Um, so often is you might end up with a mix of both. And I have seen some organization, again, it very much depends on the maturity level of each of a department as well. I have seen some organization where every quarter they are very much trying to improve their current process. 
right? So they, it might not be like product where you can try to apply something new, but they might be always looking at how do we properly maintain? How do we elevate the standard that we have set for ourselves? Again, OKR is not as aspirational and like, you know, sexy almost, but they are things that track their work properly. And they are things that they want the rest of the organization to know that we're working on. So when it comes to, again, there are two types that you might want to put in, right? It depends on the type of organization or the type of department and the type of work that they are doing. But again, with OKRs, there's no one strict rule than the others. I work with the gaming companies where they wanted to make sure that everything OKRs in, in their system was all aspirational. It was a way for people to let loose, right? So they had a very different way of setting it. Um, but they were just kind of like, we want you, like, you know, that side project that you're very, very excited about that you're going to do whenever you have time or where we dedicate 20% of your time, that is the one that you put as an OKRs, right? So again, people have done it differently. I haven't seen a lot of organization that does the whole aspirational thing. And that organization, the gaming, what I just mentioned, they are ahead of a the curve. Um, they are quite innovative in the way that it thinks. So that's how they wanted to do OKRs and very much promote it. But I would say around like 50, 60% of the organization that I work with um, will have also type of... Um, sort of like running of a business type of objective, but in a always looking at adding the, the metrics to it, right? So are we trying to increase um, like, like increase something like your metrics or are we trying to make sure that we stay within a certain margin? That's the type of objective that they'll end up putting into the system. Thank you so much, Wendy. As we approach the end of our time here, I want each of you to write one thing in the chat that you're taking away of value today. And I want you to just, let's blow up the internet. We're all just going to blast this at the same time. Uh, you know, uh, thank you for joining us today, your terrific questions and for your engagement. Uh, there is so much knowledge to be shared in this community. Thank you also to Wendy for joining us and providing us your insight from nearly 10 years in the trenches with OKRs. Uh, I know Wendy's going to stick around for a few minutes. If you have additional questions we didn't get to, if you need to hop, that's okay. We get it. But if you we didn't get to your questions today, we're going to follow up with a recap and a link to the recording. We'll also make sure that you get the deck. And uh, if you want more info or you want to set up a demo with Ally to drill down on some more questions or to see the tool or get a good example of what tools look like, here's a link to do so. Um, and uh, now go ahead and click send on the things that you're taking away uh, from this session today in the chat and see if we can break the internet doing it all at once. But uh, at any rate, um, Let's see, a lot of thanks and uh, a lot of thanks for the insights. Um, a lot of people like the metaphors earlier uh, as the new ones are rolling in. Set a better rhythm for OKR review. Yeah, that rhythm of the business operating tempo piece. Um, OKRs is GPS. OKRs need to be revisited more often than biannual to really have an impact more near term than we do today. Excellent. The analogy of KPIs, OKRs, balanced scorecards. Love your metaphors. Uh, love the explanation between OKRs and KPIs. Excellent. Well, it sounds like you've all got some tools in your toolbox that you can take back to your desk, hopefully right now, immediately, and, and in your next conversations with the team start developing that network of champions, right? And, and start moving the needle on this stuff. So please, please, please don't let this sit on a shelf. Uh, use it. Uh, you've got the experts at Ally to reach out to now. You've, you've got sort of a friend in the business, so to speak. So, um, you know, reach out and uh, check that out. Now, um, we are going to close our main session. And uh, if you want to continue, and stay on with us for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, 10 minutes, 12 minutes or so, uh, please go ahead. We'll just give it a minute. 
let folks drop off who need to drop off. If you want to stay, stay. And I'll open up a new Q&A. always oh yeah a couple more takeaways too and by the way i want to point out uh, uh as karen point out in the chat video and unmuting are enabled now so we're switching from webinar mode to interactive mode i feel like we're superheroes or something being able to do this <laughs> with technology because uh, when you try to reach large numbers of people it's not always feasible to have all the back and forth with live conversations but but you can switch modes a little bit. So um, feel free to switch to your gallery view and uh, turn your videos on if you want to. And uh, we'll, we'll kick off the rest as more of an interactive conversation. So uh, what additional questions do you still have for uh, Wendy or, or for me? But um, you know, more importantly, Wendy, while well, we've got her. <laughs> so. I think Jackie had, Jackie had a great question. Um, I don't know, Tyler, if you can scroll back up. Um, yeah, let me Jackie check Jackie mentioned, out. without violating any client confidentiality, do you know of any org doing well with oh. OKR culture and implementation? I, I said Zapier and Auth0 come to mind, but uh, there probably are others. Those are just the first ones off the top of my head. And I know Zapier has posted some, uh, very transparent kind of public information, maybe even broadcast some of their meetings around this or something. So I'll have to go uh, find the resources. I might be confusing them with uh, GitLab or GitHub. GitLab. I was, GitLab. I was going to say, GitLab has a great one. Um, I'm just going to put them in the chat here. But they documented, um, it's pretty much like their playbook. Um, so I just put it in the chat. Oh, there um, you go. Yeah, yeah. It, it's been fantastic to see how they have done it. Um, I think the question is very much around like my organization will never do OKRs, even real strategy. And it's hard to know what direction to look in for possible or to join um, with true OKR embracing culture. Um, when it's an interesting one in the sense of like why I mentioned HR often holds um, a lot of cards when it comes to OKRs and that's why they should be part of like the, the, the champion, um, the, the network. And, and the reason why I ask is um, often like when I talk to org organizations that have implemented OKRs and have done it like well, is I will ask them the question of, well, you know, what difference has it made? Right. So you hear a lot of things around, yeah, you know, why we see like higher productivity, like there's better revenue. Like one of the organizations that we just did a case study on, which was Trend Micro, they mentioned that, you know, with OKRs, they were able to release one of their features faster, which means that they were able to get the, the, the revenue um, significantly more because they were able to, to launch it quicker. But from a people kind of like culture perspective is I seen a lot of companies that will come to me and say, you know what we've seen a huge uptake on is people telling us that now they understand what the purpose of the organization is or like now they feel part of a mission. Um, they understand why I'm coming to work. Um, so it's that element that often it can be harder for leadership team to not look into because when you're talking to strategy right like the leadership team might come to you and say well we're already doing it right like we're doing fine like why do we right. need to change it so they don't necessarily see the issues but with organization that you know i i have worked with it's like when they did survey like you know and they asked people like frank questions like would you be able to um, tell us what the three to five objective of the organization is. Um, and people can't. Um, I believe MIT had a study like a couple of years ago where they saw like, you know, top, top performing organization and they did the survey. And I think only like 60% of leadership team were able to name what the company objectives were out of like a multiple choice. And as it cascaded down to like the next level, it went down to like 20 or 30% of manager understood what the company goals were. 
that's a red flag. Yeah. And, and often the leadership team will not, will not think about those things until you bring it up, right? And, and surveys has been a great way. Like one of the companies I worked with right before we sent out OKRs where they sent the survey to ask, do you know what our company objectives are? How align? Um, how well would you rate us in terms of executing of our objective around alignment, transparency? And the biggest thing is these are your leadership team's accountability, right? It is that accountability, even for you as a chief of staff, to be able to hold us, you know, like accountable of, yes, we're having a company of strong alignment. Yes, we're having an organization of transparency, like it's not HR or chief of staff role. It's all of a leadership role. So sometimes bringing these data can have a little bit of an impact to be able to say, okay, if we don't do anything, what's the consequence? People will not be motivated. You're not going to get full productivity. A talent will leave, right? It'll be hard for you to attract like new talent coming in. Um, what are the consequences of not doing something like that? It's again, it's, it's asking those difficult questions and it might give you an idea of how, how they think about it, right? But I seen like, especially from an employee engagement, again, I'm sure all of us are encountering that with like the mass exodus of people leaving their, their job um, because of COVID and all of these things. Like talent is going to be really difficult to retain and even attract like in the next few months to come. So how do we make sure that we provide, again, an, a, a culture of transparency, of alignment and having true purpose at work? That's awesome. You know, um, gosh, so many thoughts going through my head, but, you know, I want to tie in on one thing in particular that you, you were just talking about, Wendy, and that is the, the kind of the bottoms up enablement uh, and getting people bought in to the strategy and aligned with it. Um, you know, there's, if you, if you read the business literature, there's a lot of, I think, you know, well-intentioned, but frankly, misguided conventional wisdom, like, you know, Oh, if you want to run your, your meetings like Steve Jobs, don't invite more people than you can feed with a pizza, you know, or things like that, you know, and you should be careful and thoughtful about how many people are in your meetings and why they're there. I, I always think it's much more a quality question than a quantity question, but, but you know, there's a, there's a, a consequence to limiting who works on strategy and who gets to decide those things. And a lot of times people see it as the leadership team. And a lot of people see it as just, you know, the CEO's job or the CEO and the COO working together or something like that, some combination. But when you can include more folks in the creation of these things, providing the inputs to them, you know, understanding all the issues that could come up and form a really realistic set of objectives and, and results that you think you can really achieve and, and kind of know what you can really achieve and what's a stretch goal, you know, and not just setting something so far beyond reality that you're never going to hit it, which is also demoralizing. Uh, it's just so powerful to have that alignment. Um, and so I love, I think it's one of my favorite parts of OKRs is that it gets that buy-in, it gets that alignment, it helps you do some of the the work that frankly, I think, I think chiefs of staff should be doing anyway to get those back to that point about facilitative leadership, bringing the right stakeholders together to have the right conversations. That's what that means. Uh, so man, uh, that's, that's just so much good information in there. I appreciate your, your insight on that. Um, any other questions? Uh, we've got about three minutes left and then, uh, Wendy's got to drop for another engagement. So, um, Let's get them in if we can. I have a question, um, and that's um, what are your thoughts around the interactions between the, the roadmap and the OKRs? So, you know, the, the product teams, they, they, they have their own roadmap, and uh, the, the, the request they're going to get, you know, from the stakeholders is more towards, you know, like feature-based output requests that you get, okay, make changes here, this is, this, this is additional change that is needed, and then asking the team to write an OKR, it seems to be kind of a backward approach, right? Because you already have in mind what you need to build, um, rather like how part two. And uh, so how, how do we encourage that how OKRs would influence the roadmaps 
and roadmaps influencing the OKRs, considering if it is more outcome based? You know what? That's a great question. Like I work, I used to work for a startup that was like product, and we would have our product roadmap where it's like changing every six months or, or even sometimes every quarter. And we we originally had the same issue where people came to us and say, like even like you know engineers or like you know product like related like like de designers or like project managers and they all came to us and say well why should I do this like I already have my roadmap um I don't understand why I'm repeating my, my work and the and the thing that I kind of like answered back was you have your roadmap and you're only looking forward right like you made your decision you're looking forward but at what point are you really taking it back to the company vision and one of our KPIs or like one of basically our guiding light was adoption rate. Um, that was like a huge one for us. And for when we did like a product roadmap, what has always been a point of contention was customer success and sales team, right? Like often product will say, come in and say, we are going to do ABC because we think this is what good customer is going to like. And we have always before OKRs, we have always gotten like, feedback from like customer success and sales to be like no why are we why are they working on those things it's like it's like it's not helping with the adoption it's not helping with new sales like why are they doing these things so it was it, it was a little bit tough to basically sit down with our director of product and just to be able to say that of course we're empowering you to to de decide what your roadmap should look like but you need to be able to answer these questions about why. Why are we picking these specific features and not the requests that customers are bringing in? In the short term, what metrics is that going to contribute to? In the long term, what metrics are we contributing to? And what are the consequences that will come picking one over the other? And we were just kind of like, and we told the director of product, we're like, you need to be able to stand in front of a crowd and answer these questions. Because that's the whole point of alignment. Because alignment can go both ways. One is you basically coming down and you're saying, this is what you're going to do. Right? This is one type of alignment. <laughs> or the other one is the bottom up, is you're getting their support. You're getting them to understand by doing feature A instead of customer request A, we are trying to move you know, our adoption feature for this specific features forward. And this is how we go to track it. At the end of a quarter, we could fail miserably, but at least we know what we're trying to get to, what we're trying to move, and the reason why we're doing this. So to your point, I think when it comes to product roadmap and OKRs is every quarter you're going to, to decide from your product roadmap, what are you going to, um, what are you going to actually build? Right. And again, it's making sure that they have all of the answers in terms of what are we building? Why are we building it? Why did it take precedence over other things? And what are the metrics that we can't, we're trying to drive here to hold them accountable as well? Um, again, we had that issues, right? Where at that point where we didn't have much of an alignment, product team were just kind of like, I delivered my feature, right? Whether people adopt it, that's the customer success job. Whether people are buying it, that's sales job. I did my job. I just built what you asked me to build. And it's giving, putting a little bit more accountability on them to be able to say, if you're going to build something great, we need to see results. Show me what these results are. Thank you so much for that. And uh, I wish we could take more. Uh, I know Wendy's got to get on to her next appointment. I'm actually going to wrap up with a quick video, but go tie all the moving pieces together. You've got some tools in your toolbox, help your teams get unstuck from post rollout challenges and, and kind of live your best OKR culture. And don't forget to lean on Ally as your friend in the business if you have additional questions. And um, I will look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you all for joining us.